So Alistair's presentation has brought home to me uh, just how distinctly lacking my presentation will be in uh, Song et uh, Lumiere. I uh, also want to say that uh, I greatly fear that my poor paper will not actually provide the Chaucer fix um, that you know, many people seem to be craving. Um, my title is obviously a, a kind of lame allusion uh, to a number from Evita, uh, which I feel um, is perhaps not so lame, or at least not so out of date, by virtue of a kind of revival that's just started on Broadway a month ago. Um, it's part of a larger project um, whose other elements include a review of North African writers on Dido from Tertullian and Augustine through Leopold Senghor and um, Fazia Mella and uh, Elaine Sixou and others. Um, a study of the ways in which the African queen has actually generated various <coughs> kinds of narratives, including the initial part of Wolfram's Parzival and the um, Middle Dutch Morian, um, as well as the kind of uh, encounter of Alexander with the Ethiopian queen in the Alexander romances. And then finally, a kind of overview of the weird and varied afterlife that Dido has had um, from the interracial Dido Bell Lindsay in the late 18th century um, through um, Katie Mitchell's London production of After Dido, um, which actually was set to the um, soundtrack of uh, Purcell's opera. Uh, but this is the literary part, um, and the way in which Dido got retold. Um, and so uh, let me just launch into that. Dido's crushing refusal to acknowledge Aeneas's living presence in the underworld, her stony rebuff of his desperate pleas, struck T.S. Eliot as perhaps the most telling snub in all poetry. <laughs> Some 400 years after Virgil wrote, St. Augustine returned the favor, signally rejecting Dido as the most debilitating symptom of his early onset, textually induced spiritual sickness. A millennium after Augustine, Geoffrey Chaucer, writing in a world apart from Trojans, Carthaginians, and Romans, in a language that none of these peoples could have deciphered, rehabilitated Dido in a series of poems that made her, if not the central, then at least the most memorable and moving figure in what Eliot called the epic of all Europe. Chaucer's self-consciously unvigilian and non-Augustinian portrayals of Dido in the House of Fame and the Legend of Good Women constitute notable features of a distinctive vernacular poetics intended to generate engaged readerships and to touch individual readers. From the time of its composition, readers have recognized that Augustine's confessions unfold as a history and a theory of reading. For the present purposes, I'd like to propose a simplified schema of the interpretive models that Augustine presents, and then consider how these illuminate Chaucer's poetic strategies for writing and reading the African Queen. I posit three phases in Augustine's development as a reader. Youthful naivete and attachment to fictions, mature professionalism and engagement with textuality, and Christian exegesis and the elevation of the sermo humilis of scripture. Augustine includes Dido in book one, introduces Dido in book one of the Confessions. Having learned the grammar of classical Latin, he begins more advanced studies, wherein I was required to learn by heart, I know not how many of Aeneas's wanderings, although forgetful of my own, and to weep over Dido's death because she killed herself for love. Who can be more wretched than the wretched one who takes no pity on himself, who weeps over Dido's death, which she brought to pass by love for Aeneas, and who does not weep over his own death, brought to pass by not loving you, O God, light of my heart. I did not love you, and I committed fornication against you. Love of this world is fornication against you. I did not weep over these facts, but I wept over the dead Dido, who sought her end by the sword. From the point of view of the mature and Christian Augustine, that is the author of the Confessions, this boyish crush provokes profound embarrassment and exasperation. The adolescent reader has nourished an infantile fixation on a character who never existed, transferring genuine feelings to empty fictions, poetica illa figmenta. In addition to this arrested emotional development, however, the schoolboy Augustine has grossly misread the text, violating the protocols of interpretation accepted by expert informed readers. Any schooled reader would know from the commentary of Augustine's near contemporary Servius or from some similar source that Dido and Aeneas did not inhabit the same historical moment, and that Virgil had concocted their romance as a text to be construed. The mature Augustine brings this home with his fastidiously professorial inquiry. Let not these buyers and sellers of literature inveigh against me if I put this question to them. Did Aeneas ever come to Carthage, as the poet says? For if I do, the more unlearned will answer that they do not know, 
and the more learned will even deny that it is true. The naive Augustine had failed to recognize that the African queen was a textual effect, inviting analysis, not empathy. Moreover, in allowing himself to be touched by Dido's sorrow and vulnerability, he short-circuited the prescribed masculine economy of reading. Proper interpretation required the male reader to identify with the male hero, Aeneas, and with the patriarchal vision of the poet Virgil. Masculine self-restraint enforced the rejection of Dido, whose sufferings constitute a kind of collateral damage in the civilizing mission of the empire. Augustine's youthful cathexis on Dido mimics the process by which the African queen fell in love with Aeneas. Both are seduced by the recital of the harrowing sufferings narrated by the Phrygian prince. Like Dido in Book Two, Augustine hangs on every word of the story, as he says, of the wooden horse full of armed men, the burning of Troy, and Creus's ghost, details that the mature Christian regards as most sweet but empty spectacles. His inclination to identify with Dido's sorrows was inflamed by school exercises that required boys to rewrite and respeak the words of characters. And we have at least one poetic declamation from 4th century Carthage, an epistula Didonis, that impersonates Virgil's queen rather than Ovid's correspondent. It's clearly a Virgilian work, in other words. As Augustine himself points out, such trans transgender performances artificially intensify emotional investment. In his prize-winning ventriloquizing of Juno, Augustine must not only have touched his audiences, but moved himself as well. What so appalls the Christian Augustine is the creation and indulgence of feeling for its own sake. He notes that, quote, if I had been forbidden to read those tales, I would have grieved because I could not read what would cause me to grieve. Augustine's disgust at his youthful false consciousness and susceptibility to cheap thrills anticipates Hamlet's exasperated response to the player's speech. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? Hamlet explicitly points out that his attraction to this set piece arises from its source, Aeneas's tale to Dido. Its anticipated power lies in the reprise of the stories that move Dido and Augustine to tears. Hamlet's passionate bafflement insistently opens the question of how such words and images, but in a fiction, a dream of passion, seemingly detached from our individual experiences, needs, and desires, how they can possess the power to touch our deepest feelings. What are the sources of our attachment to Hecuba, Aeneas, or Dido? How can we allow transparently empty fictions to stir our deepest emotions? The hysteria experienced by the author of the Confessions seems, if anything, to surpass the masochistic pleasure in corrupt grief and sorrow experienced by his earlier naive self. This stems in part from the conviction that in his imaginative empathy for the suicidal queen, the schoolboy rehearses his own self-destruction. As an icon of excess and polymorphous passion, Dido fueled the young Augustine's desire to desire. He says that he came to Carthage, Cartago, that cauldron, Sartago, his kind of pun there on the kind of flesh pots of, of, of North Africa, to that cauldron of shameful loves which seethed and sounded about me on every side. He says he was amans amare, loving to love and taking pleasure in feeling for its own sake. Yet whatever hostility the Christian reader and writer feels towards Dido, the dominant emotion is a self-loathing brought on by ever allowing himself to be touched by Dido. In the schools of Carthage where he studied and taught, Augustine learned dispassionate philology and methodical analysis which, as correctives to emotional overinvestment in the text, assisted his progress to a new level of professionalized reading. He learned never to be caught in a barbarism or a solecism or to violate the rules of grammar and utter the word homo without sounding the H in the first syllable, that is, to avoid African provincialisms. <laughs> Mastering a hypercorrect pronunciation and received scholarly opinion equipped Augustine to participate in a transnational interpretive orthodoxy and to uphold the emperor's Latin. The self-conscious skills and labor necessary for the invention and imposition of meaning on any text introduced an aesthetic distance between reader or teacher and the text. The one might align with Aeneas as masculine subject and political agent, and with the author's art and purpose, a mature reader did not experience raw identification with individual characters, and indeed bad reading might be detected through the ex excessive responses of amateur. The pleasure of the text arose not only from genuine learning, we know Aeneas never set foot in Carthage, and elegant insight, but from the deferred gratification provided by the reinforcement and the claim of other expert readers. 
Augustine's capacity to make meaning seems to have won him competitive success and esteem, not just in the schools, but in his professional life, in his home city of Thagast in Carthage, and then briefly in Rome and Milan. In the last months before his baptism, during a period of meditation and reading at Cassiacum, Augustine and his disciples gave a day over to the reading of Book One of the Aeneid, and then later, an entire week to the study of Books Two through Four. In the Confessions, he quotes Virgil on Dido verbatim, offering a perverse tribute to the textual regime he now, in his third phase as a, of reading as a Christian, he rejects. He turns back on the merely formal constraints of grammar and pronunciation, and on the preening competitiveness that drives the production of ever more subtle unpacking of meaning. The consequent removal of aesthetic distance additionally allows him to recoup the emotional engagement with the text that he had felt in his first stage of reading. Having put aside the Lectio Difficilior in favor of the Sermo Humilis of God's revealed word, he could now immerse himself in reading and indulge the extremities of emotion that mark every page of the Confessions. The sexless, pre-adult voice that uncannily calls out tole lege, tole lege, permits Augustine to recover his inner child. No longer responsible for fashioning interpretations out of his own viscera, he could now simply grasp or take part in the biblical verses, confident that the transcendent, preordained meaning will simply course through him. The confession stands as Augustine's rejection and reconstitution of his two earlier phases of reading. On the one hand, he has converted the literary and moral failures of the naive reader into an uninhibited embrace of the Vulgate's unsophisticated verses. He has transformed his compulsory study of the errores of a certain Aeneas into his end-directed pilgrimage to the heavenly Jerusalem. The structural patterns and literary illusions that he has built into the confessions challenge the skills of the most sophisticated second stage reader. Yet a full understanding of the text's subtleties forces the acknowledgement that in quoting, mimicking, and repurposing the Aeneid, Augustine is undoing Virgil's epic. Ultimately, in unloving Dido, the confessions outdoes the African queen, barring Aeneas from the texture of the reading process and opening the possibility for writing Dido differently. In thinking about Augustine's reading program, it's worth pausing for a moment to reflect on how, how, how remarkable it was that a model of patristic exegesis based on his arguments dominated Chaucer's studies for decades in the 20th century. As Brian Stock observes, Augustine advances an ascetic regime of reading that finds its pleasure in, quote, the satisfaction that results from the quest for a world-denying way of life through the study of the Bible. Augustine seems to show little interest in spoiling the Aeneid, as he would spoil the Egyptians. His dismissal of the poet, and arguably his most, the poet's most compelling character, makes it difficult to believe that he would have countenanced applying his method of reading to other compositions in Latin, let alone to an obscure vernacular with scant literary history, like Chaucer's English. The school exercises that Augustine found so tedious and oppressive, being forced to learn by heart the wanderings of some Aeneas or other, seem over time to have detached Dido from the ambit of Virgilian narrative. Across 30 generations, schoolboys seemed regularly to cafect on the African queen, and ultimately to invent for her an autonomous life outside the classroom. The distinctively, this distinctively medieval Dido speaks with a lyric voice. Though epic events still constitute the ground of her persona, she presents herself not as an agonized, desperate victim, but as a self-conscious subject elegantly articulating desire in language. Dido appears elusively as well in male-voiced lyric poems, often as Maya Dido, an intercessor or beloved who seems familiarly present in this world of learned verse. Though strong feeling and through strong feeling and self-possession, these avatars of the African queen establish themselves as notably independent in their presentation and in their disconnect from the portrayals of Virgil and Augustine. The Dido whose sufferings Chaucer retells owes much to Virgil and Ovid, as his narrators affirm. Beyond this, without claiming that Chaucer perversely revoices a thousand years of schoolboy crushes, we can detect in his Dido a manifest debt to the lyric traditions of the Latin and French Middle Ages. Yet such traditions can hardly explain Chaucer's exceptional fixation on Dido, which, if not the equal of Augustine's for frenzied narcissism, um, nonetheless, it seems invested with the desire to desire, and in the experience of feeling for its own sake. Chaucer's narrators present themselves as inexperienced, but not adolescent. 
as identifying with a literary character, but not as naive. As mature readers, but resistant to mature sexual relations. Augustine's powerful heterosexual desire finds its natural outlet in the flesh pots of Carthage or in the nameless concubine he acquires. Chaucer's narrators thrive on lack of consummation. They dwell in suspension and longing. For both he had thing which that he nulled, and eke ne had thing that he wold. The narrators of the House of Fame in The Legend of Good Women have no designs on Dido. Unlike Tarquin in The Legend of Lucrece, they cast no predatory, proprietary gaze at Koch, Desir, and Blind Lust, and that finds itself possessively the image of her recording, all we knew. In contrast to the hardy Tarquin and Augustine, the Chaucerian narrators are sexual non starters. They know not love and dead. They pain him to praise love's art, although they hadn't never caught. The god of love regards Geoffrey as a worm. They have too nothing id of, indeed, a positive obstruction when it comes to love. <laughs> like the young Augustine, and this, after reading and writing many books, including presumably the Aeneid, the narrators identify against their own masculinity. The dreamer in the House of Fame scolds Aeneas for the harm of the roof caused by his untruth, and goes on to inventory another half dozen false heroes. The narrator of the Dido legend expatiates on the queen's generosity, compassion, magnanimity, and truth, while vilifying Aeneas's duplicity. The impenetrable injunction at the end of the legend of Phyllis, trusteth as in love, no man but man, stands simply as the most outrageous instance of this persistent cross-identification. Dido's narrators then, <clears throat> Dido's narrators then identify against other male characters, reproving masculine adventure in the form of sexual conquest, and evading prescribed homosocial alignments and affinities embodied in masculine ideals and systems of meaning, such as in Aeneas and Virgil. Chaucer presents these mediating agents not as cases of development arrested at some premature stage, but as fully elaborated perspectives that the narrators choose to occupy. Accepting the possibility that fictionalized readers will never grow out of such fixations denaturalizes the protocols of interpretation taught in the schools to produce homogenous male readerships for Latin texts such as Virgil and the Vulgate. To portray literary cathexis as indeterminacy, longing, suspension, compassion, resistance, furnishes a means of reading Dido differently, of telling her story in ways that subvert or supplement the narratives of Virgil, Ovid, or Augustine. Chaucer's narrators allowed themselves and their readers to be touched by Dido in ways that made Augustine bristle, and that Virgil may have intended only unconsciously, and they offer this as a centerpiece of a new vernacular poetics. I've compressed a section here which talks about the ways in which this argument about how Dido operates is a special case that allows us to understand more clearly um, the way the Chaucerian narrators in that Legend of Good Women, or especially in Troilus and, and Cressida, operate or even the poet operates in texts like the Life of Bath's prologue. Um, I also um, have omitted a consideration of the ways in which we might read the City of God um, as an anti-colonial or even post-colonial text produced presumably in the heavy Jeru heavenly Jerusalem, but actually in North Africa, using the master's language, Latin, but trying to kind of subvert that um, by the sermo humilis um, into a new form of expression. And compare that um, to Chaucer um, writing um, in a spoken language, essentially spoken language, with very little literary history connecting it back to these master texts and trying to negotiate that connection. Um, I want to move on then to kind of reactions to what Chaucer's doing that help to illustrate, I think, the argument I'm trying to make. Bishop Gavin Douglas, the first translator of the Aeneid from Latin to English, uh, which he finished in 1513 but, didn't, but wasn't published until later, um, <clears throat> enacts a complex and decisive confrontation with Chaucer on this issue of Dido. As a classicist and humanist, he necessarily regards Virgil as of Latin poet's prince, master of masters, sweet source and spring and well. <laughs> On the other hand, Chaucer is the vernacular ancestor who sanctions Douglas's own vernacular poetry. For as he standeth beneath Virgil in gray, under him as fair he grant myself to be. So just it's a genealogical kind of doubling, just as Chaucer stands right beneath Virgil, so I stand right beneath Chaucer. So there's this kind of you know, connection of male writers that, that come in that genealogy. Yet Douglas feels compelled to voice qualms about the ways in which me master Chaucer greatly Virgil offended. 
He has greatly the prince of poets grieved, saying he followed Virgil's lantern to form, but radically misrepresenting Dido. Douglas seems confounded that somehow Chaucer is still stuck on Dido, that the great poet's professed dedication to the project of poetry goes hand in hand with his oblique, finely non-deferential attitude towards its sacred texts. He recognizes the historic possibility that Chaucer's writing opened for the mother tongue in Britain, but can scarcely countenance the eccentric, emotional susceptibilities that distract Chaucer from submitting to the masculine authority of Father Virgil. While Bishop Douglas offers no critique of Chaucer as a Christian reader, he would surely be in agreement with the mature Augustine that the English poets being touched by Dido makes it impossible to take him straight. So Douglas claims indulgently that he would excuse Chaucer for all manner of reproofs. He marks his over-identification with Dido up to the fact that he was ever God wed, a woman his friend, provoking us to reflect on the implications of the ordinarily unspoken normative position of men's friend. Douglas's observation that Chaucer or his fictionalized readers showed too much feeling and too little textuality finds some confirmation about a decade later in a Chaucerian apocryphon printed by Richard Pinson in 1526 in the Book of Fame, the third of his three-volume collection of Chaucer's works issued in that year. The letter of Dido to Aeneas, which has never been edited, by the way, might well constitute, as Julia Boffi has observed, a direct response to the suggestion in the legend of good women, ho so will all this letter have an admined read of it, and in him he shall have feed. The letter, which is not expressly attributed to Chaucer, offers a compressed translation from a French version of Heroides Seven. The poet, who might have been a woman or a man, and I've arbitrarily chosen female pronouns, says her own failure of joy and love has constrained me to write this rueful song of poor Dido. The speaker literally inhabits the text of Dido as reader, writer, and translator. She repeatedly calls attention to her own textuality, simply crafting the poem, causeth my hand to shake, me hand quaketh when I write thy name. The poem becomes not just the record, but the source and performance of feeling. For great fury I against him take, his deed I hate and shall during my breath. She fuels her outrage simply by recording her compassion for poor Dido and intoning her betrayer's failures, false and a has forsaken the queen by great wrong, exemplifying false untruth, unkind dealing, and double, and selfishly indulging his false delight. The knot of marriage that Juno trusted should last is now become both loose and unsteadfast, for this untrue man did break the promise. Her compassion for Dido finds empathy among the gods themselves. The muses wake every drum for poor Dido that thus piteously arrayed. She explicitly invokes the Chaucerian interface when she calls upon Lady Fang to blow up thy trump of slander and of sham. In the L'Envoi of the Translateur, she addresses good ladies, impersonating Chaucer's narrator and telling them to beware of love, sith men be full of craft. The piece as a whole, in emphasizing compassion for Dido and loathing for Aeneas, makes the persona's strong emotions so central as responses not simply to the translated letter, but to Dido. Dido as an extra-textual figure, and they provide a remarkable rehearsal of how readers might re-experience Chaucerian cathexis in the reading and telling of Dido's story. And now for some tales. I would like to conclude this account by, of reading Dido by considering two ballads from the Persifolio manuscript, both of which likely date from the 16th century. The first, Aeneas and Dido, um, is a short narrative cum drinking song that, like Augustine, dismisses the queen's tears, but for quite different reasons. After the consummation between Dido and Aeneas, we have the final stanza, Dido wept. But what of this? The gods would have it so. Aeneas nothing did amiss, for he was forced to go. Learn, lordings, learn, no faith to keep with your loves, but let them weep. It's folly to be true, and let this story serve your time, and let twenty Didos burn, so you get daily new. <laughs> the second ballad, Queen Dido, seems to have enjoyed wide popularity since a number of 16th and 17th century pieces um, are set to its tune. <clears throat> it recasts in 23 stanzas the encounter in Carthage, where Aeneas tells the story of Troy's fall, with words so sweet and sighs so deep that oft he made them all to weep. 
I really should have Richard come up here and perform this ballad so we can get the quite right intonations and so on. No one, however, seems more moved by these words than the Trojan prince himself, who cries so profusely that where he sate, the place was wet as though he had seen those wars again. So, so that the queen, with Ruth, therefore, said, Worthy prince, enough, no more. While Dido spends the night in tears with boiling breast, Aeneas and his remnant skulk off without a consummation of any kind. After a brief bout of sighs and sobs, Dido pierced her heart. Anna's account of the queen's death catches up to Aeneas while he sojourns in an eel in Grecia, apparently sort of on vacation from Lavinia. Um, as he ponders the words, holding the letter in his hand, his lusty courage then did fall, and straight appeared in his sight, Queen Dido's ghost, both grim and pale. No need here for a trip to the underworld, and Dido's spirit shows no reluctance about eye contact or direct speech. She says, therefore, prepare thy flitting soul to wander with me in the air, where deadly grief shall make it howl. Thy date is past, and death is come. As in Virgil, Aeneas pleads, this time, however, for his own life. Oh, stay a while, thou lovely sprite. Be not so hasty to convey my soul into eternal night. Oh, do not frown. Thy angry look hath made my breath, my life forsook. But this Dido has no tears to shed. And the haunting, the haunting that she promised to the Aeneid comes immediately to pass. A multitude of ugly themes about this woeful prince did dance. His body then they took away, and no man knew his dying day. In typical ballad fashion, these songs treat Dido as a familiar subject, susceptible, susceptible to strong feeling, and the episodes resolve with finality and with no hint of Brazilian ambages or emotional confusion. Such ballads occupy a register off the radar of Augustine's three-stage schema, below that even of the lewd theatricals that seduced him. Chaucer, on the other hand, seems to have known such popular rhymes in English, which he obliquely recalls in his own poetry, as Richard reminded us yesterday afternoon. But as a ballad subject, Dido emerges not because of native popular rhymes um, or because of Latin uh, learning by schoolboys. Instead, her presence is, brought almost, is almost certainly brought about as the outcome of Chaucer's peculiar fixation and his vernacular poetics.